On February 17th, 1991, uh, took off on a BAI mission uh, about 120 miles south of Baghdad, uh, climbing through about 32,000 feet is where I experienced the problem. My plan was just to climb to the moon and go home, uh, try to save a bunch of gas. Uh, but I felt a bang in the engine. You are leaking tons of fluid. It looks like gas. That's why I'm wondering what your guess is. Okay. It's all coming out right where the hook meets the engine. Copy. Okay, how far do I got to go? 40 or 60 miles. Might make it, Nick. Yeah, you will, Homer, man. Don't worry. For as long as pilots have been getting into aircraft, pilots have worried about getting out of aircraft. It's only natural. The newness of flight, of seeing the world from above the world, forced the pioneers of aviation to consider possibilities mankind had never considered before. As far back as Leonardo da Vinci, the idea of floating safely down from above has fascinated theorists. But with no place to descend from, designers made little progress. The coming of aircraft inspired experimentation. In those days, every flight was a test flight. Whether the aviator was a careful scientist or a moonlighting longshoreman, the result was usually the same, a crash landing. In place of wings, we use spindles on this ship. The large ones are the main lifting lifters. Those few occasions when the pilot walked away and the plane didn't need repairs were cause for celebration. But there was a serious side, and as tragedy after tragedy piled up, engineers started thinking about getting the pilot safely out of the aircraft. By the first aerial battles of World War I, parachutes were more or less dependable, but bulky and so difficult to use that most pilots refused to carry one. Attitudes like that made the relatively tame air battles of World War I among the bloodiest in history. When a plane was so badly damaged that it was headed down, the pilot went with it, slowly, often with time to salute his killer. It was gallantry born of a simple truth. If you can't get out, you go down with the ship.
I've got the nearest divert for you, Hopper, all my team for 134. Is that what you got? Yeah, I got it. I'm not going to make it. So at this point, I figure I've got three options. Uh, the best option, the first one, was to make it across the border uh, and land at Hopper Albertine at 8,000 feet of runway there. Figured I'd have one stab at it because the weather was uh, marginal when we took off for that location. Uh, the second option was to get across the border and jump out. Third option was to ride this jet out for all it had and then jump out uh, and take my chances there. Is this all the airspeed you can get? That's it, man. Well, I can dump the nose, but I really don't want to. I want to keep this wind going for me. Yeah. By World War II, parachute packs were smaller and less intrusive. The planes themselves had fewer wires and struts to work around. In smaller, single-engine planes, a pilot had to remember one thing, evacuate to starboard so that the prop wash would carry the pilot away from the plane's tail rather than into it. fighters are massing for an attack on our bombers, while our pilots watch every move of their varied tactics. The Jerry's make a sneak attack on our bombers from behind. Gun camera film, captured from the enemy, reveals how they hammer our bombers with their 22 millimeters. This one had half his tail shot off, but it's still going ahead. On the other hand, if you are in big planes, your escape route may be difficult. The manner in which a pilot or air crewman bails out is dictated by the necessity of getting clear of the plane. The position of the escape opening in relation to the tail structure and other aircraft parts. turned back by enemy action. You know, Spikey, if you need some more lift, you might want to throw your flaps down. 5-3, border's uh, 55 miles. Copy. They're going to hang out for a little while, Nick. OK. So that's when Nick really took over on the radio, uh, coordinated for the SAR, coordinated to make sure that, that uh, we had at the Eagle still there to cap us, and that uh, they had search and rescue. I understand you've got uh, choppers in the air. Vent one choppers. That's affirmed. Have you got better scramble them now? Nice. Got drum to where we're going to be. Air Force films of the Army's newest fighting plane, the jet-propelled P-80 Shooting Star. The P-80 is believed to be the fastest fighter in existence. The secret of its spectacular speed lies in the new knife-edged wing and its powerful kerosene-burning jet engine. The P-80 operates at high altitudes with long range and at high speed. Every advance in technology brought pilots new opportunity and new unforeseen trouble. Jets so increased the speed of flight that ejection seats became mandatory. There was simply no other way to get safely out of a speeding plane.
The solution to the problem dated back to 1912, when a French aeronautical engineer proposed aircraft that could actually expel a pilot as it crashed. His simple idea? Have the cockpit built in the barrel of a cannon and pull the trigger when something goes wrong. Understandably, pilots weren't quick to embrace the technology. It took 30 years of rocket sled and animal ejection tests before pilots accepted ejection seats. about between 40 and 45 miles from the border. I'm uh, between 12 and 15,000. And I get another bang, a uh, second bang out of the engine. OK, now you've got fire coming out of your engine. It looks like it's falling. What's falling? Well, it looks like you got sparks and shit coming out of your engine now. OK. Bulldog. <laughs> OK, I'm having a more serious problem now, OK? Sitting on an explosion, once unthinkably dangerous, became part of the training of all pilots of high-performance craft. Practice. Get yourself in an ejection trainer and go through the procedure. It's been calculated that you can't get yourself positioned and pull the D-ring or face curtain to the canopy jettison stop in less than a second. The practice may save your life at that moment of truth. The human form ejected into a 600 mile an hour airstream slows to 250 by seat man separation. With a zero lanyard connected, your chute would open in three and a half seconds at 160 miles per hour. That's why Air Force and Navy experience shows that out of nearly 6,000 ejections, not one man was lost due to chute destruction at high speed. Perhaps the biggest improvement was also one of the simplest. The explosion that blasted a pilot out of his plane was replaced by a two-step acceleration. The result? Fewer broken backs and more successful ejections.
As aircraft specialized and expanded the operational envelope, ejection technology became more elaborate. The engineers tinkered with downward ejection systems. Capsule ejections, where the whole flight deck separated from the plane and floated down on parachutes, made some sense for large aircraft. But pilots never liked the helplessness of ejecting while still strapped into the cockpit. The F-111 and B-1 both depend on capsule ejections. The SR-71 brought high-performance flight to Mach 3 at over 100,000 feet. The SR-71 ejection system required a windscreen and enough bottled oxygen for a 15-mile freefall. In most ejections, explosives blow the canopy upwards and the wind pulls it away from the plane. The AV-8 Harrier, with its ability to hover, posed a new set of challenges. To make ejection possible, the Harrier's canopy is banded with explosive strips. When the pilot needs to get out, the strips explode and the plane's canopy disintegrates. The pilot rockets neatly through the shattered plexiglass. Escape at low altitudes usually succeeds only when the aircraft position is straight and level. Now an exploratory development program has found a promising solution. A system that puts the ejection seat into a vertical upright attitude automatically. A pilot can eject safely from an inverted aircraft 50 feet above the ground or at deck level in a 90 degree roll. Benji 1, Benji 2, Victor. Benji 5, 3, if you could squat.
Roadblock emergency, please. You got that spike? You want me to do it? Yeah, I got it. I don't know if that's such a good idea, is it? I don't know. I've always thought that it's sometimes difficult, sometimes easy to make an ejection decision. Uh, the easy ones are when your wing gets shot off or your engine blows up or your flight controls lock up. That's pretty self-evident that it's time to, to leave the aircraft. Uh, there's other, other times when, when the pilot hopes he can salvage the situation or he hopes things are going to get a little bit better. But by waiting that extra moment, it's uh, certainly possible that you're going to put yourself out of the ejection envelope. The decision to eject or not to eject is one of the most difficult any pilot faces. Save the plane or save yourself, or both, or neither. The training films make clear the official position. One of the biggest causes of fatal ejection is delayed decision. The earlier you make your decision, the better your chances. If you don't eject in time, there's no equipment that can save you. But fate dealt pilots a warning almost as soon as ejection seats became standard equipment. The very first pilot to eject in an emergency watched his plane bank gently and settle undamaged in a nearby pasture.
there is no such thing as a routine ejection, and pilots lose limbs, eyes, even their lives just getting out of their crippled aircraft. The equipment's got the capability to get you out safely if you make use of those factors under your control. Know your equipment and procedures, and know them well. Make your decision early, so your actions will be positive and correct. So, I figured, well, it's time to really get going here. Cleared everything off my legs, uh, tightened down my lap belt, made sure everything was clear out of my way. Mac, you tell me if you see any fire. In general, the ejection sequence can be divided into three phases. Pre-ejection, ejection, and post-ejection. It's pretty incredible when, uh, I mean, that was my 39th mission, and, uh, you know, we'd flying out to the shot at a lot, but hadn't got hit, so when I finally get hit, it's anger. It's like, uh, I can't believe these guys got me. Ejection is a flight within a flight with its own checklists and pre-flight rituals. And from the day we get into pilot training, and even before you even step in the first airplane, the other thing they stress is emergency procedures. Every pilot who finds himself in an ejection situation faces an almost impossible decision. A decision that, once made, can't be taken back. A decision that can save a life or cost a life. I'm looking at all these lights lighting up in the cockpit, just going, there's a fire light. I've always wondered when that thing would go off, and, and then I confirmed it was on fire. And uh, People asked me, they said, what were your caution lights saying? They're all the yellow ones. I said, hey, I had so many red ones going off. I didn't really get too concerned about the yellow ones. Okay, it's red sparks popping out right now. Okay, just tell me if you see a fire. Okay. Stay with it, dude. Okay, you're on fire. Uh, okay, you're on fire. Bulldog, we've got him out. We've got him out. He's out of the... Bulldog, we have a good shoot. Bulldog, Benji, do you copy? I copy, Mark. How far are the choppers away, Bulldog? And confirm good shoot. Good shoot. How far are the choppers away? Good shoot. We've got him out. We've got him out. Good shoot.
it's a pretty awesome sight. Uh, once I got in the shoot, to see an F-16 come out from between my legs on fire and just keep going. Uh, apparently, it went for about eight miles before it hit, uh, still on fire. Uh, I could see around me uh, places where uh, the Iraqis had previously set up camp. Looked like maybe light infantry. Uh, I could see where they had built fires, and they were well dispersed. Uh, so that led me to believe that there were people there uh, not long ago. Made the landing, and uh, and I find myself you know all alone on a place that looks like the moon. As the rain came, uh, it started pretty light, and then got really heavy with lightning. Um, had some strikes that were really close to me. That concerned me most at the time because I'm holding this radio with a big antenna on it. So the first hour passes, uh, I hear nothing. I would monitor the radio to see when I heard people overhead uh, to see if they had anything to say to me. I clicked the mic, mic a few times just to let them know I'm still down there. Uh, then uh, the second hour comes and it's probably the longest of my life. Uh, I still knew that those guys were going to come. Uh, but then you start thinking about other things, like, uh, well, what if everyone just screwed it up and no one shows up? You know, what if these guys get me? Um, am I ever going to see my family again? About a minute later, I heard the faint sound of helicopters. Best sound I've ever heard in my life. I'm holding my strobe because I don't want them to land on me. Next thing I know, I get a face full of Black Hawk helicopter about uh, 20 yards in front of me. As it turns out, they land about uh, what they said was 25 meters from me. Uh, and I'm on the ground with my back to them, uh, hunched down on the ground because rocks, sand, everything is flying. I'm holding my strobe up with one hand, yelling on the radio in the other. That I told them, hey, guys, I'm staying here till you come get me. Uh, so I came out of my crouch. I get a face full of this uh, big Special Forces Army guy. He's got his night vision equipment on, and he is just uh, packed with firepower, too. He grabs me, uh, and I tell him that, hey, I'm Benji 5'3", because I had no contact with him. I just wanted to let them know who I was. And he asked me if I was okay, and said, yeah, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs>